when my world feels chaotic, a few things happen to my body and mind. I feel anxious. I get super sad. I don't sleep well. I don't eat much. I cry at random. I go inward. When my dog, Ren, when his world feels chaotic, he humps people. <laughs> Here is Ren humping my head shortly after we moved into my new apartment. <laughs> when life feels lonely, unbearable, and confusing, Ren humps things. I have a hunch it's 0% sexual, and he's not, in fact, that horny. Nonetheless, many have fallen victim to Ren's humping, which he accentuates with light grunting. You can't hear it in the video. <laughs> like, like when last week I was traveling for work and my friend was dog-sitting sit for me, sent me this text. She's pushing him off of him. <laughs> no one is safe. And it happens often enough that I decided to create a hashtag for it called the unhappy humps. <laughs> Feel free to populate that at your own leisure with whomever has the unhappy humps in your life. I was trying to think all week at how I could incorporate that video of my dog humping my head and I feel so satisfied. Great talk, thanks for coming. <laughs> Aside from the small fact, though, Ren and I do have a lot in common. Small, pointy nose, dark haired, fast walker, likes carrots, extroverted, humps when you're anxious. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> and look at this. This is amazing. Brittany Schneider came up to me this morning, introduced herself, and she's like, I painted you, Ren. And I'm like, do you even know I'm talking about him? This is the most magical <laughs> little gift. So thank you, Brittany, wherever you are. I love that. And I'm going to treasure that. So for those of you who don't know me and don't know where you are, my name is Ashley Mary, and you are at Creative Mornings. I am an artist, designer, illustrator, eater, sleeper, runner, shopper, personer. I share a studio space in the Northrop King Building with fellow lady bosses, Minnie and Paul out there, and Beth Kath. Here in my playhouse, as I like to call it, I create colorful messes on canvas. And occasionally, people let me make colorful messes on their walls, too. My work is often described as bright, playful, bold, and happy. I like these words. They're uncomplicated. They're sweet and pure. They're light and easy to hold. But do not be deceived. Just because my work leans towards pinata filled with tiny unicorn vibes, it doesn't mean my life is always as vibrant and happy. In fact, sometimes I feel like the only thing my life has in common with a, a pinata is its ability to be busted up into a million pieces on the ground. Sometimes that's how I feel inside. <laughs> Messy, stuffed with too many thoughts, easy to bust up, break open, and feel empty. These are times in my life I feel the most anxious, confused, sad to the bone, out of control, and chaotic. Rarely to me, though, is anything good or bad or black or white in my world. It's all color, and sometimes a season, a moment, and an experience is both and Chaos, I believe, is both and. In chapter two of my story, the here and now, today, my name is Ashley Mary. But there was a seven-year period in chapter one where I was Ashley Barlow. And you may have seen that name accidentally appear during promotion of this event. It's an honest mistake I blame the internet on, but one that left my stomach sinking when I saw the name appear. And names are a funny thing. It's a word, ultimately, um, but one that is deeply personal. It's your identity, right? It's how we're known, our names. So when I saw my name shared incorrectly around this event, it stung a little. And it wasn't a level 10 crisis by any means. It's a first world problem, for sure. It's a hangnail of sorts. It's a small reminder of past pain that catches on things when you least expect it. But I believe in the God of details meaning I try to pay attention as a spiritual practice. 
I try to pay attention to the patterns happening around me and to me, and I try to discern my role in my next steps. So today I'm taking a hint from the universe, and I'm telling a story I typically like to save for more intimate settings over strong beverages. <laughs> when I was 22, when I was 22, I got married to a Barlow man. We were young, doe-eyed, and we met at a small Christian school in Michigan where the slogan for seniors was ring by spring. I had one by the summer of my junior year because I'm an overachiever. <laughs> so right after my graduation and our wedding, that's a cool sentence, <laughs> I, started, <laughs> I started working at a mini mega church in the suburbs here in Minnesota. Now, I wasn't Christian growing up so much as I chose it as a teenager, and I pursued it with the fiery passion most other teens had for Hanson and Backstreet Boys, <laughs> aging myself. But I believe we're wired for devotion at 15, and my main crush was old JC. I always loved me a hippie. I wore my WWJD bracelet so hard and with such conviction, I still have the tan line on my wrist from it. And I loved me some church. It was a space of community, positive adult attention, playfulness, service, and theology. And I really loved theology as a teenager. Actually, I loved learning about anything that was mysterious and unknown. I was a proud member of the Goosebumps Club circa 1994. <laughs> Ghosts and ghouls, sign me up. Ouija boards, I'll light the candles. You see dead people, cool. Tell me more about it, Bruce Willis. So after high school, I went to this small private school where I studied religion with a capital R. But only after quickly realizing my dreams to become a Broadway star for, were perhaps far-reaching. My favorite classes were on mysticism, Indian religions, and more conceptual themes. I've always been deeply curious about all the things we cannot fully know. That is me at my core. I got to continue my studies of religion in Rome and in India, and in all these opportunities, they kept formulating my ideas of God human connectedness, and matters of the heart and soul. While studying religion, I also did take a few art classes, as one is forced to do in liberal arts school, a few drawing courses, printmaking, and I did eventually make my way to one painting class, though I didn't really like it much, to be honest, ironically. Somewhere my last semester of senior year, I fell in love with collage, though, and the rest, as they say, is history. I have not stopped making art since senior year of college. The first five years of my art were primarily collage focus, my process being heavily controlled. I would cut out little images from old magazines and create these stories with little pieces. We can go to the next slide. Everything was fairly tidy and precise and it had a kind of a graphic quality to it and I wouldn't glue down anything until it looked just right. I would stitch into my work with thread, sometimes adding fabric. We can go to the next slide. Here are some examples. But let's put that on the back burner for now because that's where it went for about five years after I graduated. And there might be one more slide. Let's test it. We're good. Cool. So working, after working at the church after graduation made a lot of sense for me. It was an environment I thrived in, and it was a safe choice in a lot of ways. I knew how to do that job and that life really well, and I got to be around a lot of people, I planned a lot of events, did skits, went on camps, I was a goof, I got to have meaningful conversation, connect with amazing non -for profits Extroverted Ashley was alive and well in that church. My 12 years in that space were really sacred too, but because life is never that simple, having my faith wrapped up into my vocation and my income, wrapped up in my community, in my free time, in my marriage, in my identity. It was too much, and especially too much for a young 20-something, navigating who she was as a married adult and as a creative female. I was a tightly wound ball of yarn. Over the course of time, about five years into my career, my spirit started to get restless. I was falling more in love with creating art and the kettle on the back burner was getting louder and hotter. I didn't feel myself in that environment anymore and I wasn't being authentic anymore. I felt more myself when I was making collages and my paintings. I felt stimulated in my soul and in my mind in different ways that nothing else could replicate and it's hard to describe. 
I feel a buzz through my bud, b blood like an electric current when I'm making art. Simultaneously, I was also falling more frustrated with the church as I was a part of it. It's politics, it's systems, it's programming, and to be honest, it's theologies. All of this made for a lot of inner turmoil, a lot of inner chaos. Nothing you could see from the outside. In fact, I probably seemed pretty normal. My chaos was contained in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit. Just like with my collages, in my life, I was the queen of control. Up to this point, I'd led a pretty charmed life that I'd created, curated nicely into a cute little package. But that started to change over time. In my art, for example, I started to play with little splashes of paint here and there. I started adding bolder, more abstract moments. I was exploring, trying, pushing the edges just ever so slightly. And inside, I was becoming confused, restless, questioning everything, and it was time to pay attention to my art. I had heard of this thing called graphic design. No joke. I. I really didn't know what graphic design was until about 2012. <laughs> I didn't know what Photoshop did or who Adobe was or that art was something that needed directing. I was a noob. I was so immersed in my own bubble those past five years. There was so much I didn't know about. But I did know that I wanted a full-time career as a creative. And I knew that I couldn't make enough selling my art. So in my later 20s, I decided to go back to school. And in order to commit to the design program that I was interested in at MCAD fully, I decided to leave my role at the church. This was a massive decision for me and a very painful and very stressful one. The church, as I was a part of it, was changing. Or maybe rather, I was changing. We both were. Which meant our relationship was changing too. And this is hard for me to talk about. I left my job for lots of regular reasons people leave their jobs. You're bored, you're uninspired, you're frustrated with the system, you want better pay, you need to change. It was all those things for me. But also my heart was changing towards everything. It was a slow burn of me trying to pay attention and asking, do I believe in that? Is that how I see things? Does this make me feel whole? Does this make me feel whole? I was discontent. Smells like a quarter life crisis to me. I could absolutely, without a doubt, tell that my spirit was expanding, and I believe in an expansive God. My God is a breathing entity, ever expanding, pulsing, moving in and through and around. And it's like water and air, but it's bigger than either of those things. And there isn't one door to the God that I know. There's not even a house with doors. There's just a field surrounded by a forest and your ability to turn in any direction to enter into the unknown. So going back to school was my chance to start to get to know what I really believed in and to get to know myself better. My chance to be around people that were different from me, believed in different things, people who didn't know who I was and didn't expect me to be a certain someone, didn't expect me to be anything at all. School became everything to me. I dove in head first and I put everything into the experience. It was so energizing for me to be in a new environment with new people, topics, challenges, skills, experiences. I became almost gluttonous about it. My craving to be enveloped in that world felt insatiable. I wanted to spend all my time at school or work on working on design and art. And the deeper I went into it all, the deeper I wanted to go and I was feeling my spirit wake up to something. The yarn was unraveling, and I started to pay attention to that. By the spring semester of my first year of school, I started to retreat into myself. My personal theologies were shifting inside. It felt scary, elating, confusing, and sad. I still went to church very occasionally, but I remember standing at a service one Sunday night and everyone around me was singing worship songs and I knew, I knew that moment was holy and sacred, but I didn't want to sing. Singing didn't feel authentic to me, the words didn't feel genuine to my thoughts, and the act itself felt uncomfortable. I didn't want to be there actually, so I paid attention to the emotions. Ultimately, I stopped going. And I don't tell this story to dissuade 
anyone from going to church. I think any religious institution is a very sacred space. And I encourage anyone to explore whatever ways they need to express their spirituality. I think that is really important. I tell this story because it's part of my chaos. It's the truth of my story, and it's the unraveling of myself. I wasn't putting much effort into seeing friends. Actually, the only thing I was putting on was a face. I didn't want to be home ever. I didn't want to be around my husband. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping much. I was making poor decisions. I cried a lot at random, anywhere that felt right. On the mat in yoga, in my car, on runs, in the shower, at bars with my friends. Everything felt so tangled and chaotic and lonely. I was emotionally exhausted, and I didn't know what I believed anymore. I was depressed. I, rem I remember I went on this long run, and I stopped midway through, and I sat near a lake, and I cried, and my stomach was in knots. You know when you're so entirely anxious, you just feel kind of sick. And you're really tired, but you're wired all at the same time. And I felt insane inside. Like, how could I feel this way? I have so much on the outside that should have made me happy, yet I was so utterly unhappy on the inside. I was so damn scared of saying anything out loud because then it would change my life as I knew it. My friendship with my husband would change, my community, my home, my reputation, my pretty, cozy life. Everything would change. All the safe things I had built around me. I could feel myself on the edge of a cliff. Brene Brown in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, says this. If we want to live and love with our whole hearts, and if we want to engage with the world from a place of worthiness, we have to talk about the things that get in the way especially shame, fear, and vulnerability. I went home after that run, and I sat my husband down, and we began the 18-month process of discerning what the hell is life and what do we want our future to look like. I started therapy pretty immediately after that and the long process of trying to feel whole again, to find my wholeness. Fast forward a year and a half, my ball of yarn was now a full-on pile the beginning and the end of the string, indiscernible, and most certainly a few knots in there as well. A lot of damn knots, actually. At this point, I was doing mostly freelance work, primarily at an agency in town. I was still making artwork from home. I was wrapping up school, and I was beginning the process of getting a divorce from my seven-year marriage and all the logistics that follow. So let's turn the page. While my personal life was falling apart in 2014, I was also changing inside in some really lovely and profound and necessary ways. I was learning all these new tools at school and I was making art more often. I was meeting so many new creatives in town, forming new friendships, trying new things. I was a sponge to the world and I could feel everything inside of me start to shift and move and I was feeling alive in new ways. And here's what I learned in that one and a half year period from sobby crying run to graduating school. Your wholeness is worth everything. Your wholeness is worth everything. Don't ignore it. It is vital to not just your happiness, but your sense of peace, identity, and light. Your wholeness is your light. Don't let that shit go out. Chaos happens, and it strikes whatever it damn well pleases. It doesn't give a fuck about your timeline and your deadlines. It will do what it needs to do. And I recommend sitting in it for a little bit, actually. Sometimes we try to fix and control things so quickly that we make it worse with a knee-jerk reaction. So let the chaos happen. And notice patterns. What keeps happening and how does it make you feel? Is anyone getting hurt in the process? What do you believe in? Do you feel yourself? Do you feel whole? And here's the most important lesson. There can be beauty in chaos. Chaos is colorful. Chaos is so colorful. And it's not perfect, and it's not tidy, and it's a hot mess. And chaos has the potential. It has this potential to become something beautiful if you let it. Shortly after I moved out of my house, I had a friend say to me quite pointedly, 
your art is changing. I can tell something is happening inside your gut that you're moving and creating from a guttural place. I recall a short cry happening right in that moment. She had put language around something I couldn't. My art was taking new shape literally and figuratively. I was painting more abstractly. Stepping away from the vintage collage I had done for years, I was exploring bold shapes and layering more. My paintings were becoming more colorful, free, bouncy, quirky, light, and happy. They were reflecting me. My art wasn't the only thing shifting either. I was also just trying a lot more outlets as a designer. I was art directing, prop styling, creating prints and patterns. I got my first big opportunity for my Ashley Mary brand with a line of cosmetic bags and then a line of tech accessories. I was playing with illustration. I was in try mode and I was so damn alive inside. Nothing made me happier than getting to make things, paint things, move things, and work with dozens of talented local creatives, many who are in this crowd today. You have no idea how much every project with you people has meant to me. Those opportunities have changed me. I was starting to find my contentment, my peace, my voice, myself, and I was untangling my knots. So let's fast forward four years later, here we are. I'm a few years into owning my own business where I get to make art and design products like my stationary line, which some of you saw outside. I get to paint almost every day and not one minute of that is lost on me. I make beautifully useless things with my hands like palm earrings and goofballs. <laughs> I still regularly collaborate with all of your lovely faces as well as with some great national and international brands. I'm back at MCAD now, finishing my master's this fall. I currently have all the things due, but I'm here instead. <laughs> I live in Northeast with my humping dog, very close to my studio. We walk to work a lot of days. And my ex and I are sweet friends in our own right. He's a good one. Sure, my quarter life crisis is behind me, but I still get to have some mini ones pretty consistently. And they suck too. And that's all right by me, because it's my chance to make something new. So here I am. I'm Ashley Mary. Thank you very much to my grandmas, Mary Lou and Mary Jane. They are the deep, creative, brilliant, feminine roots to my name. For a few years now, Mary has been my legal last name, and it is my pure joy to confuse anyone who asks for my last name and to watch their face as I give them two first names. This is my story. I am Ashley Mary. I'm a painter, designer, illustrator, sleeper, eater, runner, shopper, personer. I am a human and a lover. My paintings now feel like this. They are often made with a bit of chaos. And with many textured layers on top of layers, I create some arrangement until it feels just right, always leaving room for something unexpected to be added or altered. I celebrate the inconsistencies in color and form and texture, and I paint until my belly tells me that this is done, and the chaos shows through on the top layer only where it needs to. My work is an expression of my values, my inner spirit, my inner goofy, pure, lovely child, my playfulness, my joy, my messiness, my wholeness. They are a visual representation of me trying not to control everything. It's my holding loosely. My life imitates my art, imitates my life. And honestly, I don't want things to look perfect. Perfect is boring, and perfect doesn't offer transformation. Tidy does not, does not get me closer to my whole self. Chaos does. Chaos presents itself with an opportunity to make something that has a rich underbelly of color. So I'm leaving you with this light question on a Friday morning. What patterns are happening in your life that you need to pay attention to? How can you be present to your chaos? What steps can you take to respond to your chaos and then transform it into something perfectly imperfect? Chaos is your chance to make something new out of something messy. And the mess is what makes you interesting and full and beautiful and delightfully different from everybody else. 
Chaos whispers, it's time to change. Chaos invites opportunity to create something new. So what will you make with yours? Thank you for sharing your space with me this morning.